Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Global Environmental Change webinar uh, towards solution science. Uh, this is the first of three webinars that the Global Environmental Change uh, section is sponsoring along with AGU. Uh, the next webinar will be September 14th. I want to thank Yuan Rao from Global Environmental Change and Greg Binder from AGU for uh, uh, helping put on this webinar. I want to send greetings to our friends and colleagues joining us from around the globe, including uh, some friends of mine from just a few blocks away. Um, this recording uh, will be posted on AGU's YouTube channel next week. David Bihar is an at-large member of the AGU Council, in addition to being the Climate Program Director at San Francisco Public Utilities Commission. And he's had many years of experience within a, a decision context in trying to make sense of climate science and what it means for those decisions. Um, I've been at Oregon State University for 11 years now, uh, largely as a climate scientist, more recently with the graduate school. I want to acknowledge uh, that Oregon State University is in the traditional homelands of the Mpinafu Band of Kalapuya, who were forcibly removed to reservations in Western Oregon after the Willamette River Treaty of 1855. AGU, uh, in addition, has committed to eight actions to combat systemic racism. I encourage you to look at the August 13th from the Prow post by AGU President Robin Bell and President-elect Susan Lozier. In this talk, Dave and I are going to describe uh, experiences that we've had together over the last uh, 11 or 12 or, or probably more like 13 years uh, in, in navigating this space between uh, discovery science and applications. I'll get rolling then. Hi, everybody. Welcome to PUC headquarters here in my bedroom in Corte Madera, California. Um, I thought I'd start with a little bit of context for the discussion, at least from my perspective. Um, first, for about 10 years, I've been talking about how we're in an era of assessment on the climate adaptation question. We're studying what our vulnerability is. We're seeking to understand the science and what it tells us uh, about climate change. And then we're trying to apply that information to our own systems, our own lands, uh, et cetera, to understand the vulnerability that we face. We're increasingly moving, and some people have started to move, but many, many more people are going to begin to move to an era of adaptation. The stakes are higher. The decision making becomes real. Study becomes spending and we need to be prepared. Whoops, that was my bad. Um, and we need to be prepared. Um, secondly, I'm in Northern California, of course, um, and that's a personal context. We uh, are experiencing a lot of the things that climate change is gonna bring. We had a unusually long heat wave that ended about 10 days ago, uh, followed by some very weird weather. We had a thunder and lightning storm that was very unusual for the Bay Area. Um, of course, that resulted in about 12,000 lightning strikes over, I think, a one-day period. And, of course, that caused what last I, I heard was over 600 fires in California, which are burning something close to 1.5 million acres. This is the third of four years we've, where we've had catastrophic fires. Those who are not in a fire zone are in a smoke zone in the Bay Area and frequently going outside is hazardous to your health. But climate denial is not really a thing here. I sometimes want to point that out because I work with a lot of folks where that is a factor in decision making. In Northern California, we tend to think about what we need to do to address climate change now and how quickly we need to move rather than the question of do we need to do something about it? That's sort of important. Um, and then finally, the science to action community has been working for a number of years on these kinds of issues that Phil and I are gonna talk about. Leaders like Julie Vano and Dan Ferguson and Raj Panja, Anna Wilson, James Arnott, Greg Garfin, Natasha Udugama, and many, many others I don't have time to mention have been active in this community. And it's time for all of us working together to step up for um, the action that we know we need to address the challenges of climate change. Oh. Um, so some terms that uh, you sometimes hear in the space, uh, first is stakeholder, uh, which broadly defined as someone who has a stake in the outcome. Uh, we also use the term practitioner, 
I like Kavita Hines definition. She's with Portland Water Bureau. Uh, someone who uses science to make decisions. Um, actionable science, uh, David will say a little bit more about that, but I still remember the first time he uh, uh, defined that for me or, or brought to mind what, what it really means. Um, as a scientist, I use reasonable methods and data to come up with an answer and publish it. Maybe the answer is 42. Um, but the way David put it was, okay, you've written a paper, but is this a robust and mature result? Can you stand in front of my city council and, and say that the answer is good enough to spend millions of dollars, or as David will show, billions of dollars? Um, solution science is a new HU term that crops up. Uh, it's a new area of emphasis in our strategic plan. Um, Co-production, I think David wants to define that one. I do. Um, it, it's going to come up uh, from several times in the in the presentation, but I'm going to call on the buyer at all peace and conservation letters that I was part of, along with Laura Hansen um, and others. Um, and we define co-production as collaboration among managers, scientists, and other stakeholders who, after identifying specific decisions to be informed by science, jointly define the scope and context of the problem, research questions, methods, and outputs make scientific inferences, and develop strategies for the appropriate use of science. It's a mouthful, but it's a big process, and um, that's how it's been defined, at least in one location. And we each have our own definition of success. Um, broadly within academia, of course, success uh, in research means having paper, papers not only published, but also cited. Um, in the space that, that I've occupied for much of my career, um, which is sort of a blend of discovery science and uh, co-production, um, my view is uh, of success is a little different. It's uh, seeing not just my research, but the research of the broader scientific community uh, used successfully in decisions. And I would see success from our perspective as in, 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 in the subjects that we're talking about now, the successful incorporation of current science into planning such that we are prepared for the effects of climate change that we know are coming uh, in an appropriate way, both temporally, spatially, and, and otherwise. And now we will turn to actionable science um, and spend a little time talking about that. So in 2017, um, at the National Adaptation Forum, which is the largest gathering of adaptation professionals in the United States, about a thousand people have been coming to it lately, a question was asked of 45 adaptation practitioners in a session. What words describe the current ecosystem of adaptation resilience services? That just means the climate service environment, the climate change planning environment um, on the subject of adaptation. And you can see from the outcome in this word cloud here that there's some confusion. There's some fragmentation, disbursement, complexity. Messy is a good word. Um, and, you know, this is three years old now, but has it really changed that much? I think we're working to change this so that the ecosystem of adaptation planning is, is a little healthier. Um, but this is this is one of the tasks we have ahead of us, and I thought citing these these decision makers in in the adaptation space would be useful. Turning to the stakes of adaptation, this is uh, from Hirschfeld Hill, 2017, a study of um, if we protected the San Francisco Bay shoreline alone, San Francisco Bay, in the ways that we protect it today, division, divided between levees, walls, and wetlands what would it cost approximately? And the, I'm just gonna focus on one and two meters, $57 billion at one meter, $212 billion at two meters. What to, what to me is striking is not so much the multiplier, but the scale, $160 billion difference. That is an astronomical sum, of course. Uh, and it doesn't mean we're gonna build adaptation in this way, but this was a really useful uh, uh, approach, I think, to at least trying to get in a, a, a a scale of the of the challenge that we face. 
So as we evaluate vulnerability and plan adaptation, we really are relying on science to tell us what to expect. We're relying to a large degree on science in, in, in you know, giving us a view of the future. In 2008, Andy Rafkin in the New York Times coined a term, the whiplash effect, which was actually uh, provided to me by Tad Pfeffer, a, a cryosphere scientist, one of the top cryosphere scientists in the US uh, at the time when we were having conversations about sea level rise. Uh, and the idea was that the, the transition from, of science from, from the science community, from the peer review literature to the planning community, the adaptation community is not always a seamless effort. The professor quoted in the article said that scientists sometimes fail to carefully discriminate between what is well understood and what remains uncertain. I would argue that's not just a failing of scientists, but of um, those of us in the adaptation community as well, who are charged with understanding this difference and, and using it. None of this suggests that the, that the scientific method, experimentation, publishing of cutting edge research is not critically important. Of course it is. But when we're talking about actionable science, we're talking about the penetration of this information into a decision a context and that doesn't that doesn't equal the, the the penetration of actionable science to the decision context does not equal the penetration of science into the science community and we need to uh, maintain an understanding of that difference and act on it in ways that that work so in order to communicate to the science community what we're talking about here we coined the term my colleagues and i in the water utility climate alliance which is a coalition of 10, 12 large drinking water providers from around the country that's been focused on adaptation since 2008 together. We deliver drinking water to 50 million Americans. We coined the term actionable science. It was rolled out in January, 2009 at what was billed as the first federal conference on adaptation that EPA sponsored in a keynote address I gave. And we defined it as data analysis and forecasts that are sufficiently predictive, accepted, and understandable to support decision-making, including capital investment decision-making. I emphasize sufficiently and support to make it clear that nobody thinks that science makes decisions for people or that scientists are expected to make decisions for you know, societal uh, bodies that are charged with that job, but that we need that help. And then, of course, the focus on capital investment decision-making in the definition highlights that at the end of the day, we will be raising taxes, raising fees, incurring debt, and finding any means necessary to pay for the adaptation enterprise. And so when the check writing time comes, we need to be sure that we're basing it on the best available science for our needs. The actionable science term kind of took off in, in the before Trump era anyway, in the federal government, and was included in one form or another in the Global Change Research Plan, Strategic Plan, the President's Climate Action Plan from 2013 and a subsequent executive order, Army Corps of Engineers, uh, strategic planning documents, and the global framework for climate services at an, at an international level. Post-Trump, we have the AGU Strategic Plan, which has included this in their recently adopted um, goals dedicated to discovery and solutions to societal challenges and co-creating knowledge with communities that use that knowledge. So discovery and solution science are two different things, but they complement one another. And, the, and I think alongside the science to action community, the pressure is now on the HEU community to, um, to perform in this area and to help society uh, deal with the adaptation challenge that we know is ahead of us. So that's the concept of actionable science. And now what we wanna do is, oh, I forgot one slide. Um, sorry, the, uh, we added to the definition of actionable science um, at, in an advisory committee on climate change and natural resource science that Phil and I were both a part of in the early 2010s. And we added the concept that it is ideally co-produced by scientists and decision makers. And it occurred to me, and it has occurred to me a number of times that we actually forgot something in the definition of actionable science. And this is coming back to something that we've already touched on and we'll touch on even more. I wordsmithed this just the other day, so it's not really wordsmithed yet, but 
I think that actionable science should draw principally on widely accepted projections supported by multiple lines of evidence while also considering the most recent observations and modeling. That's the tension between what's new and, and extremely important in the peer review literature on the one hand and actionable science on the other hand. So now that's the concept of actionable science. Now let's turn to a case study. The piloting utility modeling applications or PUMA project of the Water Utility Climate Alliance was launched in 2010 at a workshop we had in San Francisco that was cons that consisted of basically equal numbers of scientists and decision makers from the water utility community. You can see here we have our own Dr. Moat and to his right, What's to his left, but to our right is Joe Barsugli from the University of Colorado. On the far left is Radley Horton from Lamont Doherty. And between them, we have Dan Pearson from New York City's Water Department and Paul Fleming from Seattle Public Utilities Water Department. We're conversing together about the needs of the water utility community uh, or individual uh, um, uh, water utilities in terms of climate information to evaluate our vulnerability and then working with the science community to understand how to wait right, how to uh, bring that together so four water utilities were part of the project and three climate science consortiums including CERC, which phil was running at the time we had a modeling advisory committee that consisted of these folks at the outset and included many many more as time went on phil and i were the project managers on it and it's a good case study of actionable science in action and so I'm going to turn to Phil now to summarize one of the projects that he focused on in Seattle. Yeah, our, um, so the, the Climate Impacts Research Consortium, CERC, uh, for the Northwest, uh, the research project for the Northwest was involved in projects with uh, both Portland and Seattle. I'm going to focus on the one in Seattle. So Seattle, like a lot of uh, large Western cities, uh, relies on a fairly pristine mountain watershed, actually two watersheds, um, and water is piped uh, many tens of miles to the, the customers, um, both the, the direct service area in yellow and wholesale customers that serve a lot of the Seattle suburbs. And in the context of this project, um, Seattle wanted to know how climate change could affect um, both the supply and other uh, relevant um, aspects. Oops, got there's quite a lag on the. There, there we go. Okay, so they came to us with four questions um, uh, shown here, and. They developed in-house hydrologic modeling capability uh, to answer the first two questions, but they wanted uh, help with some of the data to go into them. Um, and they asked uh, CERC for help with number three and four. Uh, and, in, uh, and, and so I'm gonna focus on number three, what effect will climate change have on the timing of the onset of fall rains and on atmospheric rivers? Now to understand the importance of this question, um, Seattle, like a lot of cities on the West Coast, uh, has a fairly dry summer climate. The, uh, the, the reservoirs in those two watersheds, are uh, they, they would hope they would be full going into the summer season. Um, and then as people start watering their lawns and using outdoor water a lot more, uh, demand goes up, but uh, because the, the rains sort of taper off to very rare, uh, the, the supply is, is shrinking. So it's always this balance through the season of, of how well that stored water will last through the dry summer uh, until enough water starts arriving to both turn around the supply end of it and the, the um, demand end of it. Uh, in some dry summers with a late fall rain, it can be a real white alcohol experience for the water managers. Now, in the context of this project, Megan Dalton with, with CERC uh, was, was lead on this, and um, the definition of timing of the onset of fall rains took some back and forth. Uh, is it a climate quantity or an operational quantity? Uh, in a sense, it was both, and we had to sort of arrive on a definition, which ended up being the first um, day after August 1st, in which a weekly rate of 2.5 inches had occurred, and we said, well, where? 
Um, and they were actually more concerned with rain falling in the Cedar River watershed, uh, which supplies two thirds of water, than with actual rain um, landing on customers. So the black curve is, the, uh, so, so this is the spring and fall rains. Um, black curve is the observed record. Um, so most years, uh, the, that definition is met uh, sometime between late August and early October uh, with a median date um, early September. Um, the downscaled climate model results are shown in blue for the, the historic period, and those match pretty closely. Um, jump forward again. Um, can you go back? Um, and in a, for the future period, um, which is shown in red, I, I, can you go back on? There we go. Um, to the graph. Thank you. Um, so for the future period red, um, for a high emission scenario late in the century, um, it shifts by about a week. So the, the lesson was, um, yeah, this is something to worry about. Um, the magnitude of it is, is not large, but it's in the wrong direction. Uh, an additional week of the drawdown, um, it, it, sort of, it sort of poses some operational challenges. Back to David for discussion of other larger Puma projects. Okay, so there were there were four, as I mentioned, we're gonna we're highlighted Seattle, and now I'm gonna touch on Tampa Bay Water. Their um, metric of greatest importance in understanding the vulnerability was the spatial distribution of rainfall. They're a run of river diverter. They don't have reservoirs like we do out west. And so where rainfall falls will determine their supply. But what they found in going deep in looking at statistical and dynamical downscaling methods was that those approaches did not reproduce the rainfall characteristics in Florida very well in terms of spatial distribution. And so working closely with their University of Florida counterparts, they invented their own downscaling method. I'm not going to explain it because I can't, but the analogs they used related to spatial distribution of rainfall. And as you can see from this overlap here, I don't have the key, but this overlap between their invented BCSA approach and uh, historical data, they had a good overlap. And so they're then able to move toward evaluating their vulnerability. In Portland Water Bureau, what they cared about was the Bull Run watershed. That's where they get their bulk of their water from. And knowing their system as they did, they found that the baseline information that was going to be used to train the downscaled climate models to help them understand stream flow and therefore inflow into their reservoirs was inaccurate in terms of the Bull Run watershed. The interpolated database that took the station data that was available and then interpolated the rest of the watershed to calculate stream flow gave them the red line, which was uncorrected. And then they needed to bias correct the reanalysis data set, which is a fairly unusual thing, I think, to at least to hear about doing um, in order to get the, the, the um, data set to match observed in terms of stream flow well then they could proceed with the uh, the downscaling and, and climate general circulation model use that was critical to understanding the vulnerability. So now Phil and I are gonna just kind of summarize the lessons that we learned from the Puma project, starting with Phil. So um, it, it became clear from these four different utilities that that um, although the the fundamental science was similar that you know we wanted to use uh, global climate models to understand how uh, the system could be affected, um, the the questions were um, uh, the specific questions were quite different and that led to the use of uh, some pretty different methods. The the learning process between the scientists and utility manager, the co-production process, as we as we've called it, was really a two-way street. It was it was important that decision makers start the conversation with the questions that they wanted to answer to be clear about what our needs were from the science, and then it was the scientist's responsibility to listen and react, kind of like a method actor. You're not going in with your tool 
as the answer. We found that in uh, in in the couple of cases that I highlighted, highlighted, the tools at the scientist's disposal were not adequate to the task. And so, reacting by then looking for the tools that will answer the questions was a critical part of of the Puma project. And I would add to that two-way street that. Um, simply understanding uh, the the context of the decision was important, um, but also just understanding uh, and tolerance for uncertainty uh, and and how to balance uh, the risk of, of unknown. Um, the utilities had to customize the approaches. So uh, David gave you the example of Tampon Bay, uh, Portland and Seattle wanted custom downscaled climate data. Uh, for running their own hydrology models. So, so that, that sort of translation step ended up being quite important. And finally, each of the Puma utilities had a different path to follow. That highlights the, the unfortunate in many ways reality, which is that, not, that one size never fits all. I, tend, I like to think of water utilities as being like snowflakes. Everyone is a little different. Well, the adaptation challenge at each and this is true, I think, for non-utilities as well, is going to be a little bit different. And this highlights the importance of listening and learning on both sides. And, you know, on the unfortunate side, perhaps the, the labor intensiveness of the process that we can't sugarcoat. It takes time. It takes people working together to get uh, the path uh, followed that each utility in this case needs. So our second uh, story of working together is uh, applying sea level rise projections. And this has its origins in an executive order in 2007 that then Governor Schwarzenegger signed that um, directed state agencies to uh, come up with plans for adapting to climate change uh, and also called for uh, some numerical guidance on adapting to sea level rise. The state agencies contacted Oregon and Washington about doing a joint effort for the whole West Coast. Um, they, uh, they contracted with the National Research Council, spent a, over a year negotiating details, um, and the, the study was launched in 2010. Um, to understand the, uh, the, the sort of context behind this, um, there were a lot of projections of sea level rise out there and people wanted to ask basically should i build an ark how bad, how bad will it be um so the the committee uh was uh, charged with this uh statement of task so a statement of task is essentially a directive from the sponsor in this case agencies of the three states to the committee um and and it's very constraining um and it turned out that this, that the, the nature of the statement of task, and I, and I should say I was on the committee, uh, and my job within the committee was to sort of assemble all of the separate numerical uh, contributions. But the, the, the challenge here was uh, twofold. One, uh, within the context that we were operating, we had to uh, separately estimate the contributions to both global and regional sea level rise. So those are uh, primarily melting land ice and thermosteric effects or, or uh, changes in, in ocean density um, globally. Locally, also things like ocean or atmospheric circulation, what's called the fingerprint effect, which I'll explain in a minute, and vertical land motion. The second challenge that we faced was that we had to do this for three dates. The Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, or IPCC, uh, commonly reports um, sea level rise projections for the year 2100, um, but much less in numerical detail before that. So within this uh, statement of task, uh, we um, fairly quickly realized that um, the, uh, the, the methods available to us were, were, were quite restrictive. Uh, so at the time, Vermeer and Romstorff had come up with a semi-empirical projection of global sea levels. Uh, we consulted it, but because we needed separate components, we had to look elsewhere. So um, the first uh, thing here is the cryospheric extrapolation. Uh, so after a lot of um, head scratching, we realized that really the most robust way that we could project the global cryosphere was uh, not using dynamical models, which at the time were not mature enough yet, 
and some would argue are still not mature enough, but rather a simple statistical approach using um, data from 1993 to uh, 2011. And uh, so the, the black curve there is simply the best curve fit, and then the gray area is the uncertainties of that curve fit. Uh, the dashed lines are the uh, outputs 13 global climate models, which were from uh, an entirely earlier generation. Uh, they ran the A1B emissions scenario. Um, and the reason we used those was, you know, we needed, um, we needed global and regional uh, quantities. Uh, and there was a paper that had been published that, uh, that did so and, and provided that and I wrote to the author and got the gridded data. Um, but those were only one mission scenario. Uh, so these, these extrapolations of components um, did not include any uh, possible deviation from, uh, in, in the one case, the past uh, rate of change uh, as a, a, a second derivative. Uh, and in the other case, uh, didn't include any, uh, well, really in, in either case, there was no possibility uh, directly to, to estimate how changes in emissions scenarios could affect our results. Um, you see also near the bottom a, a smooth black curve labeled ocean density, or I'm sorry, um, uh, added dynamics. So um, at the time, there was a, a, an emerging understanding that the uh, edges, particularly of the Antarctic ice sheet, could undergo some kind of instability that would lead to some really worrisome high-end scenarios. And David will say a little bit more about that in a minute. Now, turning to the regional components, we have um, the um, cryosphere, I'm trying to advance, maybe you can do that for me. Um, so the regional cryosphere um, right. included, oh, there we go. It too many times. So the, 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 the regional uh, part of the cryosphere, we, we just included the um, dynamics at, to reach this upper edge of the gray area. That's why it's asymmetric. Now the ocean contribution is not just density, but also the local effects of changes in circulation, which widens the cone of uncertainty. The fingerprint effects refer to the gravitational effects of changes in land ice on ocean water. Uh, if an ice sheet disappears, it is no longer exerting a gravitational pull on the water around it, and that water would then uh, subside. So that um, mainly uh, the Alaska glaciers uh, provide a little fingerprint effect, uh, and that's shown in red for 49 degrees north of Canadian border. Um, vertical land movements, VLM, are uh, different north and south of a certain point, which I'll explain in a minute. Um, actually, let's just go to the next slide. So the committee um, had to provide guidance um, uh, across the, the span from the Canadian border to the Mexican border. Uh, so it's shown here with, with the, the latitude um, uh, on the left. North of Cape Mendocino, the Pacific plate is subducting under the North American plate and causing uh, the North American plate to, to buckle upwards. And that leads to a gradual increase in the altitude of the coastline relative to the geodetic center of the Earth. Uh, and so that is an effect that is quite different from uh, the uh, transverse motion of the San Andreas Fault south of the triple junction. So that's why there's a jump in the projections uh, at about 40 degrees latitude. The bands for 2030, 2050, and 2100 are shown. Uh, to get these ranges, we had to do some artful uh, combining of uncertainties from all the different sources. Uh, we also uh, tried to build in some variation with, with the um, uh, uh, emissions, but that, that ended up uh, being too difficult. Um, but the important thing here is there is a dark uh, or bold curve for each of these. You can see the, the thick red curve. And um, the committee had a lively discussion about what we should call that. Uh, it's not the median projection. It's not. The mean projection. It's not even the most likely projection because um, we, at the time, uh, it, it was impossible to assign probabilities to different rates of change of all these different components. Um, we, we decided it wasn't even our best estimate. So we ended up simply calling it the committee projection. 
Uh, and as I mentioned, the, the ranges are also uh, uh, somewhat problematically constructed. Uh, next slide. So we combine all this into a table. This is a very simplified version of table 5.3, where uh, we uh, provided the projections in centimeters uh, for 2030, 2050, and 2100. Um, with, with the ranges uh, from that previous diagram. And so my question to David, um, this is what we were told to provide. Did this uh, provide guidance to planning? Well, let's hear from San Francisco Mayor Ed Lee first. In 2013, Ed asked uh, a group of us who were starting to talk about sea level rise to consider the impact of sea level rise on our planned investments. That is investments being made by the city and county um, departments in long-term capital projects. At least let's ensure that we have a screen uh, related to sea level rise vulnerability um, for those projects. So we started by looking at the science where all adaptation planning should start. And you can see the NRC 2012 report that Phil just explained in the middle there. That was a range, I use inches, he used centimeters, which is internationally correct, but not helpful for my constituency. So 17 to 66 inches was the range in NRC 2012. The National Climate Assessment, however, was coming out at around the same time, Paris et al. posed a range of eight to 79 inches. And at the same time as all of this, the fifth assessment report of the IPCC was putting out their report and it said 11 to 39 inches. This is confounding in that these all are authoritative sources all saying somewhat to very different things, um, particularly at the high end. So we had to do a bunch of work and that work involved co-producing understanding of this science in deep and lengthy conversations with you know, for me, it was it was Phil, uh, it was Tad Pfeffer, it was Dan Kayan, and a number of other authors of the NRC report in particular, um, and then others who were involved in IPCC, Sea Level Rise Chapter 9, as I remember it. And I learned what I think we all know, um, which is that IPCC doesn't do upper bound. I'm not going to go into the reasons for that, but they just don't do it except kind of verbally in code. Um, and you can find it in the summary for policymakers if you're pointed to it as I was. Then we looked at two regulatory bodies or two agencies in the state of California, which remember had requested the NRC report in the first place, the California Ocean Protection Council and the California Coastal Commission, the latter is a regulatory permitting body. And we found that neither of them included a mid range or what I call, though Dr. Moat doesn't agree with this, the most likely estimate um, for sea level rise. And the reason they didn't do that is that the reading of the NRC 2012 report was very difficult. It was not written for a lay audience. As I said, the targets of the, of the thing itself didn't really understand it well. And they had missed what Phil just went into in some depth, as I think he called it the committee projection, which is the 36 inch just about one meter sea level rise number, which is very similar to the IPCC number, of course, of a meter. And when we found that number, we're like, okay, we don't have to have the low extreme and the high extreme, the two ends of the PDF, if you will, that are least likely to occur in a probabilistic universe, which we may or may not live in, but we have something that's kind of in the middle. And that allowed us to develop the set of projections for San Francisco's use in the guidance that the mayor had asked us to do with a low end, a mid range and an upper end. We published this uh, table. Uh, we did away with the low end as insufficiently precautionary and had these middle range and upper end projections for the use by our engineers and planners and other staff in evaluating vulnerability as was directed by the mayor. We also assigned words used in plain English to the guidance. And this is where, you know, Phil and I probably disagree. Uh, we chose the words most likely to describe the projections in the middle. Um, possibly we should have said likely or more likely, but most likely is what we used. 
and unlikely but possible we used as the upper bound. This is intended to signal that uncertainty is irreducible. It's part of the adaptation enterprise. And let's look at the range of what's possible in thinking about our vulnerability. It's a critical part of all work related to adaptation, I think, as we all know. And that was included in the sea level rise guidance that was adopted by our capital planning committee in 2014, revised in 2015. It was the first document that addressed sea level rise in the city and county of San Francisco. And it was a lengthy co-production and science translation process that was customized to help San Francisco rather than being built into the process of the NRC uh, paper, which is what I think could have happened um, and possibly ease some confusion if it had been an original purpose. So now we're going to turn to another sea level rise issue, uh, the high end challenge, which I think is something that's growing. This is those three authoritative sources with a fourth one added, the Rising Seas in California report from 2017, written by eight or nine um, highly respected climate scientists under the auspices of the Ocean Science Trust in uh, a California um, kind of nonprofit slash governmental agency. I'm probably not describing them correctly. The point is that what we're seeing in median projections is a trend over this period that is actually relatively unchanged. I wouldn't even argue that it's going down necessarily, but it's because that's sort of in the noise. But the median projections, the intermediate projections, what I call the most likely in a controversial way projections are not really changing, but the high end is blowing up, at least as manifested by these reports. And that brings two challenges to the adaptation community. On the one hand, we're looking at increased uncertainty over time. Um, and on the other, we're looking at a very large high end number. This is 10.2 feet. When you add a 1% storm, the FEMA storm on top of that, you're in the area of 14 feet already. That's a giant number. It's almost a throw up your hands number, I'll be honest, for um, decision makers in the state of California because it's so huge. It came from the rising seas in California report, as I mentioned, but itself that led to uh, sea level rise guidance that was updated by the Ocean Protection Council in 2018. Now, to a large extent, this work and this guidance was driven by the publication of the DeCano and Pollard 2016 paper in Nature called Contribution of Antarctica to Past and Present, Past and Future Sea Level Rise. This is a fantastic paper of incredible importance and great sophistication doing land ice modeling for the first time in this way to drive an understanding of how paleoclimate information might help us understand the future. And it got a lot of media as well. In fact, it was the most cited article in the news and social medias uh, of 2016. Though it's extremely important and, and valuable, it also had a number of questions associated with it. And this is a list of questions that I'm not going to go over that I got from talking to Rob DeCano, the lead author, who, along with David Pollard, has been incredibly um, uh, available to talk through these issues, as well as Robin Bell, uh, who was the uh, incoming AGU president at the time and now is AGU president, and Jonathan Bamber, who at the time was the EGU, European Geophysical Union president. Um, both of whom are sea level rise experts. And they revealed a number of questions about the DeCano and Pollard paper that are not a secret in the science community anyway. Subsequently, Edwards et al., Clerk et al., and additional work by DeCano and his team revised some of the projections, at least on the temporal scale that matters to the adaptation folks, which is tends to be on the century scale rather than the multi-century or millennial scale, and suggested that maybe we needed to go back and do more modeling. And Rob himself had said, we need to do more modeling when this came out. This is all very preliminary work. It's not intended for action. Nonetheless, it did penetrate the rising seas in California report and drove to a large extent, though probably not exclusively, the 10.2 foot number at the upper end of what's suggested. Nonetheless, after these papers came out, we saw a new set of headlines that indicated, among other things, that the sea level prediction that was so terrifying from DeCano Pollard 16 might 
be far less likely. This is the whiplash effect that we talked about earlier. Um, climate experts do what they're supposed to do, which is have conversations and do modeling and, and break borders uh, in terms of the science and then go back and revisit and experiment and et cetera. Um, and what I think is important is that we make sure that in the adaptation enterprise, we are ripping from neither the headlines in the consumer media, nor the latest peer reviewed journal, the science that we wanna use in adaptation planning. The science to action movement, if that's what we can call it, and I think we should, suggests that we need to find a balance uh, between these things. Not that new information is not extremely important, but that we need to have some sort of approach to new information that matters and is helpful to the adaptation enterprise. I muted myself for a second. Okay, so there was a paper that came out in 2019 that I was pleased to participate in, led by Detlef Stammer, who is now the head of the World Climate Research Program and was the co-chair of the Sea Level Rise Grand Challenge Committee of the WCRP. Uh, Kate White from the Army Corps of Engineers was also part of that paper, as well as some very well-respected um, climate scientists and social scientists. And this paper attacked the question of high-end estimates for stakeholder applications. And it used this graphic to illustrate the question, uh, the issue. So if you look at the, the blue PDF here, this combines all of the uh, realizations from any of the RCPs, any of the emission scenarios. And what we know about this PDF is that the tail on the high end is much longer than the tail on the low end partly because of all of the interesting and new theories that we're learning about land ice in Antarctica and Greenland, of course. But the question at play is, when does a new piece of science that perhaps achieves plausibility, but is new, move from one side of this gray bar here to the other side into the PDF that expresses the tail of the distribution that is intended to be actionable information. The suggestion in the Stammer et al. paper is that we need multiple lines of evidence, which is the term that I used in my part that we're missing in the actionable science definition earlier. But I think this is still a conceptual uh, thing. We still need to flesh this out quite a bit. There's a, there's a high end sea level rise workshop next week, an international one that is gonna go, try to go the next step uh, from this paper I hope both in conceptually describing how these things, how this, how science should migrate from one side of this gray bar to the other side of this gray bar, and I think also is intended to take on the actual numbers themselves to try to figure out which uh, estimates, if you will, ha have made it from one side to the other and, and that should be using. So I'm concerned I haven't been controversial enough, so I have one other unrelated point I want to make about actionable information. And that relates to emissions scenarios and challenging a gloomy narrative that I don't think serves the adaptation enterprise interest at all. This is a table from Housefather Peters in Nature as a commentary. And it suggests among other things that we should look at some probability description, non-quantitative, it's important to suggest non-quantitative, say non-quantitative, between one emission scenario and another. For many, many years, since AR5, I guess, RCP 8.5, which is the worst case scenario in the IPCC fifth assessment report, was described as business as usual. If we continue doing what we're doing, this is where we'll be. And in fact, the 8.5 scenario has become the default scenario for thinking about planning because we haven't seen a ton of action on climate change in terms of actual reduction, actual mitigation policy that is massively uh, requiring the reductions in, in GHGs. On the other hand, current trends and the agreements achieved in the Paris Accord, the nationally determined contributions that 185 countries signed up for and are just beginning to implement now, possibly with a mixed record, but still, um, would indicate that we're in a three degree C world, potentially plus or minus in the year 2100. 
three degrees C it corresponds a lot more to RCP 4.5 or 6.0 than it does RCP 8.5. And that's why House Father Peters suggested that we have a more likely scenario related to 4.5 and three degrees C than 8.5 and five degrees C. And they suggest this is important for a couple of reasons. First, they say that in the world we're in now, the focus has been on the extremes rather than the multitude of more likely paths between. And secondly, an interesting point they make is that overstating the likelihood of extreme climate impacts can make mitigation seem harder than it actually is. This could lead to defeatism because the problem is perceived as being out of control and unsolvable. I think these are questions that are timely to address, both because of observations of climate, um, of, of GHG emissions, and, and also because we're moving into the adaptation enterprise, as I said at the outset. So putting that aside now, I'm gonna move to a few, what we called techniques. Um, there are a lot of young people on this call, I hope, that are looking to do climate services, science translation in the future. We know that that's a growing interest in the PhD community and we need to find avenues for that. This is not gonna answer all of those questions, but this is some of the techniques that we've used in the science to action community. First, we take our white papers. This is the Puma paper on the left. This is from the um, Advisory Committee on Climate Change and Natural Resource Science paper that, um, that I mentioned Phil and I were part of, and we do what, we're, what I'm calling reverse translation. We take the white paper written in lay language and we put it into academic speak and put it into the peer review literature and climate services and conservation letters. I've already quoted Bayer et al, not for the last time, but Vogel and McNee and I put together a summary of the, of the Puma project that drew heavily on the social science research as well as the interactions that we talked about um, uh, in, this, in this presentation. The Science to Action community has been very active in AGU. On the left side, this is the thing that Julie Vano produces for us every year, the virtual swirl that combines all of the, pro all of the um, sessions related to Science to Action, trying to show the co-production dynamic in play with case studies. The growth in this um, kind of uh, process in AGU has been very strong. Uh, Julie and I and Phil and Dan Ferguson and Raj Panja put together this paper for EOS that accentuated um, this effort and why, why we think it's important. And finally, I said earlier that science doesn't answer our questions, and that is absolutely the case. Decision making under deep uncertainty or DMDU techniques are an irreducible significant part of the decision making process because um, uncertainty itself is irreducible. Well, not irreducible, but it's not going to go away. We know that. So adaptation pathways, decision scaling, and other kinds of approaches that, you know, understand that we're in a cone of uncertainty uh, as we go forward um, and, and help us to make decisions that are iterative in nature, adaptive management in, in type, uh, and don't rely on any single number, which we are well aware we're never going to get um, as we look forward into the kind of um, uh, temporal scale that adaptation is going to address, which is largely, um, at least for the utility community, I think for a lot of us on a century scale. As we look forward in a century, we're not going to have no uncertainty, and so we're going to need these kind of techniques and tools. So all the pressure is not on science, it's on the decision community as well. Um, we know that. So that concludes the case studies. And before we get to questions, Phil and I are just going to kind of uh, absorb, uh, present some overarching lessons that we that we took away from all of these experiences. Yeah, thanks, David. So first of all, um, the concept of actionable science um, for uh, particularly for researchers who have an interest in this space, um, but even for those who don't. Um, just being aware that there is a large audience for a, a wide range of geophysical research uh, that, that that falls under the AGO umbrella, and the the, the sorts of um, challenges that David has described, um, 
so so I would say two two main ones are the the loading dock uh, notion, um, wanting your research to be noticed uh, in the in the research space, uh, but also in the decision space, uh, publishing a paper and then maybe having a statement in the uh, in the conclusions that says, you know, decision makers should heed my results. Um, that that sort of putting it out there and hoping hoping somebody pulls up to the loading dock and takes it. Um, isn't an effective way to do actionable science. But the second, um, as David illustrated with the high-end sea level rise estimates, um, be really cautious about um, overstating how well something is known. It's fine to put out a provocative, interesting result. Uh, and of course, it's difficult to control how the media will report it. Um, but making sure that there are caveats in the paper that sort of say, hey, you know, this is an interesting new finding um, more research is needed before we, we really understand the system well enough to, to advise uh, uh, how, how to use it. I think we found, and we touched on this before, that, that starting with the question of the adaptation challenge in front of a particular community or entity is the right place to start when you know, collaborating between science and decision making. Uh, it puts pressure on the decision maker to start with the questions they're, they're, they're seeking to answer. I've been trained over the years to not say, tell me what climate change will bring, but to say, here's the challenge that we're facing. Tell me what we understand about this challenge from the science uh, and so that we can then proceed to have the conversation that we need to have. I... Uh, uh, I have to say that in uh, this relationship with David and in a lot of other uh, working relationships, uh, I've come to really respect um, people in a decision space who are navigating a very different system. Uh, and having that kind of respect for each other is really important. David earned my respect through his tireless efforts to understand the science. Uh, we would often have a phone call that started with him saying, so I recently read this paper by so-and-so, or I was looking on the NRC report on page 106, and uh, you know he would often run circles around me with his understanding of of this uh, of this field because it mattered so much and he was taking it very seriously and uh, and he's very intelligent um, and I've met a lot of people outside academia who really can reach into the academic world much more effectively uh, often than than we can reach into their world and and understand it so that that patience of uh, the iterative uh, nature of uh, reaching understanding uh, is really important. And, and I have to say that it's tremendously valuable to have a champion uh, within an organization like David who, who can uh, sort of represent the science to, to their organization. So the relationship that Phil and I had was critical in us, you know, parsing the meaning of the NRC 2012 report, the conduct of the Puma project and, and many other challenges that we faced since then. Um, I was able to call upon Phil and ask for hours of his time, um, sometimes over a cocktail, sometimes over the phone, to really interpret the meaning of the NRC 2012 report in particular. And, and because I knew him, I was able to do that. And because he was open to it, he gave me that time. And that highlights the importance of relationships, which are important in every field, of course, but in this field, no less, that's no less true. If you, if you build the you build the relationships um, across the communities that need to work together on these issues, all else follows. As I uh, illustrated with the two uh, case studies, um, it's really crucial to reach a shared understanding of, of what the problem is and what the question is. Uh, the, the simple example of the fall rains uh, was fairly easy to to arrive at, um, but the this question of what what is a sort of worst case sea level rise scenario, uh, really, I think we're, we're still not there. And uh, but but uh, for the the scientists to understand um, the decision context and how the science question uh, could inform that decision context. And I think we're repeating ourselves a little here at the end, but make sure the scientist appreciates that that context. Um, that's that's 
that's a starting point, um, just as it's important that the decision maker appreciates the subtleties and complexities of, of climate science and the uncertainty. Um, you know, early on, we learned in the Water Utility Climate Alliance that, you know, we're not going to get simple answers. You just don't have that opportunity. Um, and I, I also think that the, the complexity of climate science is sort of an order of magnitude more complex than many uh, other science translation challenges that I faced in my career, say hydrology, fisheries biology, et cetera. Um, and so it's, I'll, I'll just add here that it's important that the, the, uh, the practitioner understand the science context and we have to put some time into that. And with relationships, we can do that. Um, we're wrapping up. We're going to be asking. Oh, that's not the right button. We're going to be asking for questions any second. Does that look as weird to you guys? It does to me. Um, let me see if yeah. I can hold on. It does look weird. There it is. So one last quote from Bayer et al. Um, the how-to guide for co-production. This is actually the first sentence of the paper, I think. In the loading dock approach to linking science to action, science producers interact with resource managers, decision makers, or policymakers in a linear transaction. Some problems are not well served by the loading dock approach. For example, the problem of adaptation to climate change. I'll leave with that. Um, I will point out before we turn it over to our leader on questions that we're going to have a party in a minute on Remo. Science to Action Reception that Julie Vayno, our fearless leader, has put together. She's supposed to have, I'm not touching anything on the on the on the toolbar here. I don't want to mess it up. I'm supposed to put the link in the um, in the question bar to this party. And you'll be able to join when we're over when this web uh, when this um, webinar is over and interact with folks in a social online environment. So thank you all very much for your patience, your listening, and your interest in the subject, and we'll open it up to questions. Thanks, David and Phil. And I will be uh, reading all the questions that people have been uh, putting in during your presentation. And so the first question that comes from Susie Mozir, and she said, we have had this conversation before. This is to David, and but I would love for you all to talk more about uh, your definition of actionable science presumes that the only decision relevant science is that which is well enough understood, but are new discoveries and outliers not also decision relevant? And if that decision relevant information is time sensitive, such as the thresholds being crossed, when does decision relevant science, actionable science in your mind? And she has a follow up as that. Um, uh, Steve Schneider, in the context of IPCC Working Group 1 and 2, had this debate that scientists being conservative want to avoid errors of being wrong about what they try to understand, while practitioners want to avoid making costly mistakes, but that may require acting on, on certain informations. So, um, Jochen Hinkle wrote a really good piece, co-wrote a really good piece a number of years ago that critiqued uh, among other things, the IPCC for being conservative, for not helping the decision community frame the risk assessment challenge by focusing in on the best accepted science. And in the AR5 cases I showed in my table about a meter of sea level rise, while not talking very much about the high end. I actually don't really care that much about that critique of IPCC. I understand why they do what they do. And we look to other sources to give us the risk management um, profile, if you will, the full range of what's possible. And as I said, high-end estimates, whether it's heat or sea level rise, are important and need to be considered. We're not just looking at the median. We're not just looking at the intermediate at all. We need to look at you know, the median and intermediate and also the high-end. The question, however, is, just to take the DP16 example, a new set of land ice models with a single GCM, a single RCM, a lot of experimental physics, a lot of um, you know, assumptions about the paleo record that um, all of those things are, are subject to uh, review and were reviewed and were critiqued in many cases by the scientists I talked to, while others thought they were really valuable, has to go through a process. 
a process that that validates that effort. And, and in fact, we saw it go through that process, and that process ended up mitigating the impact on the temporal scale through 2100 that we care about uh, most in the adaptation community. So the question is not do we use high-end projections, but when do we use them and which kinds of high-end projections do we use? Are we going to subject ourselves to the whiplash effect by a new paper comes out, it gets the headlines, our electeds get concerned in a community where we don't have denial as a problem, um, and then we incorporate those into planning? No, we do not do that because that's going to just result in whiplash when that new piece of science gets mitigated, gets um, revised, then we go back and do it again? No, that's not a sustainable thing. So now, Susie and I have had this conversation. It's an important one because, as I said in, in citing Stammer at all, we need to figure out when this new and important science should penetrate the decision environment and be the subject of, of spending decisions, and when should it wait a little bit until it's been replicated or when multiple lines of evidence support it. Thanks. And Phil, do you have anything to add or we can move on? Okay. So next question is from Sanjeev Kumar and he said on, um, on two-way interactions, it is well said and recognized need to need it of uh, actionable science. But the great challenge is it is not built in the scientific or academic reward process. I would say neither funding regency recognize it nor the nature journals. So how do we build in the academic process so that it can be sufficiently developed in the process. Yeah, uh, well, maybe I'll take a first crack at this one. Um, you know, I, I I largely agree with the comment, but not entirely. Um, so I work at a land grant university, and one of the missions of land grant universities is to do this kind of work to um, translate science into uh, uh, particular decision spaces. Um, in our state, we have uh, uh, extension services that operate both with uh, in, in agriculture and in forestry and also um, Sea Grant operating on the coast. And all of those have been active with their communities, um, you know, over decades or a century or more, um, not just, uh, and, and then more recently with, with uh, trying to help them grapple with, with climate change and rising, rising seas. So there is, um, in, in, in a land grant university, there is a recognition that that kind of work has value, uh, and that that uh, when we look at um, faculty or or others who are advancing through their careers, um, it's not just about you know counting marquee publications and citations. It's also about impact, and uh, extension has a very particular way that it evaluates impact. Um, so I, I don't. You know, I don't really know whether it will be um, feasible for other universities to start to adapt their uh, internal reward structures to do that, to see that kind of work as a valuable extension in quite the same way as as language universities do. Uh, on uh, and then on federal agencies, um, you know, National Science Foundation traditionally has been very much focused on basic research, and even though there is a a, a, a supposedly equal um, evaluation criterion around broader impact. Uh, I think it's widely understood that intellectual merit uh, is is what carries the day, um, and broader impact um, rarely uh, actually translates to if we do this project, um, society as a whole will be better because this understanding will lead to better you know decisions about um, geophysical risks or whatever it is. But then on the other hand, you have the mission agencies. Uh, Department of Interior funds a lot of science. And it stood up the Climate Science Centers about 10 years ago. NOAA has had the RESA program for over 20 years uh, that I've been involved in. Um, and those are, are really trying to straddle this space a lot more. Uh, unfortunately, of course, the, the magnitude of funding available to do this kind of work uh, is, is dwarfed by uh, the magnitude of the funding for um, uh, discovery science. Um, and then, you know, that's not even touching defense spending, uh, research uh, uh, for defense. I don't know, David, if you want to add anything to it. No, I wouldn't add on the academic side, but I would reiterate what you said, Phil, about the resources and, and funding for climate service enterprises. It's been lean and getting leaner. Um, part, is, part of that problem is Congress. Part is that states don't have 
seem to have the funding I think we need to see more climate service funding um, created. And that will engage academics uh, and those with PhDs who, who wanna find a career path other than academia to engage with the decision community. And, and I think over time as the adaptation enterprise gets more urgent that we've got a shot at that happening. Yeah, and I should add that you know we're, uh, our, our audience, uh, both for this call and more broadly, um, does not just include academic scientists, but also scientists working in federal agencies, each of each of which has its own um, sort of culture of acceptance and enthusiasm for uh, this sort of solution science. Um, and, and those two may may change over time, uh, either toward more more acceptance or or more um, uh, pigeonholing. Thanks. I also just want to point out that AGU has another program called Thriving Earth Exchange, which is based on the community science. So I think that can be a way for people, for scientists from academia to get more involved in this. And next question comes from Anna Wilson, which is, could you address the longevity of the relationship between during the case studies? How will those relationships make it easier to design and conduct this co-produce projects in future? I completely agree that the time put in for learning in all involved communities is really essential. Are there efforts to quantify and understand other benefits here beyond individual projects? Yeah, that's um, a great question. Do you want to go first? Question? Question? Go ahead, Phil. All right, I'll start. Uh, um, the, the longevity, uh, I, I think the, the uh, relationship built in the Puma project have outlived that particular project. Um, in the Northwest, there's ongoing relationships at the University of Washington and Oregon State and in the, the RISA and the climate, I think to a degree, climate science centers that are funded by the Department of Interior <coughs> um, in ongoing vulnerability work, which of course is continuing. Um, you know, the work that I, I was doing on sea level rise was built upon quite a bit through the process that revised the um, the uh, the guidance for incorporating sea level rise into capital planning and then heading into the future. Uh, I think those relationships uh, can and, and should be maintained. Um, you know, quantifying the value and, and how that works, it's, it's, it's a good good idea to do. And I don't know that we've done it except as you can see in the Vogel et al paper in climate services, as well as the white paper on the WUCA website, um, and other papers that have been produced out of these efforts kind of talk about the the uh, the dynamic that existed and how how it was sustained over time to create value. Yeah, I, I mentioned earlier the, the you know the the value of a champion within an organization. I think the same is true when the organization is a university, um, and uh, you know sometimes having a really strong champion. Uh, who is around for a long time is is the key to making a relationship like this work. Um, on the other hand, you know, everybody moves on at some point. Uh, at the Portland Water Bureau, we had worked for a long time with Lorna Stickle, uh, and she retired, and we now uh, had a, a great handoff to Kavita Hein. So when when the sort of outgoing person, whether they're, you know, for whatever reason they're leaving, even getting reassigned with the organization, when they can fully spin up a replacement who sort of inherits the the energy and the relationship, um, then it's a way to make it continue. But there was another element of the question, which is, you know, we we tend to, we in in uh, in a research space tend to think of projects, uh, particularly tied with a specific uh, chunk of funding, as having you know a beginning, a middle, and an end, and they have a hard end when the money runs out. Um, this kind of relationship. Uh, is best sustained in a different model. And that's where uh, long-term entities like the NOAA RISA program and the what are now called the Climate Adaptation Science Centers uh, provide you know, enough stability to really build up the learning, the patience, uh, the relationship, the connections. And, and then that, um, that can transcend individual smaller projects like the one we had with as with Seattle Public Utilities around uh, the Puma project, but it, it goes on into other other efforts as well. Thanks. Our next question comes from David Gorlick, and he asks, from a utility perspective, when it comes to incorporating recommendations or scientific findings to change the course of planning, 
uh, their different uh, expect expectations for academic partners and researchers versus consulting engineering groups doing similar work for utility. Is that question, are there differences between academics and, and consulting engineers? Are there different expectations? Um, well, it's hard to say whether that expectations refers to the process or to the outcomes. Um, in terms of the process, the expectations can be very different. Um, the consulting engineer is receiving an hourly uh, pay uh, on that project that rewards his company for his services. Um, and they will, you know, automatically kind of be in a co production mode because if not, they'll be fired. Um, in an academic, setting you're you're, you're you're often they're paid consultants but let's look at the situation where that's not the case where you're seeking advice and translation which is what i do uh, and seek gratis all the time can't hire a scientist it actually takes a lot, a lot of effort to hire anybody at a city and county level so it's like can you please talk to me for a while and you know i i don't know that the expectations are very different with the people that i have relationships with because they want to be helpful they're interested in the process that translates science into the into the decision environment. Um, it's not as much their 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 uh, professional focus sometimes, but um, it's it's part of it. And I think people want to see their work used in a, in a real environment. So at the end of the day, the differences may not be that significant, um, though. Of course, it's often the case where we'll bring in a consulting firm to do a long term project. Um, um while at the same time on occasion uh, and this was true in the puc as well when we hired casey brown to do a decision scaling and evaluation of our water supply vulnerability uh, we're getting the consulting engineer from academia itself right. thanks and another question from nancy when wagner i hope i did the name correct and can you relate how you would revise your approach when there is less time for decision making and science to practice, such as COVID or a potential pending volcanic eruption. Hmm. <laughs> well, Phil, you're closer to the volcanoes up there. Why don't you take that one? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but I'm not a geologist. Um, I wish I could uh, get get one of my geologist colleagues uh, on the line quickly. Um, I, I think it's still, uh, you know. I think it still boils down to uh, sustained relationships. So, um, you know, we have faced droughts and and other kinds of you know climate events that happen or that unfold over a fairly short period of time. Um, and having a, a, a sort of ongoing understanding of what the science is and you know whom to turn to. Um, so in the in the RESA space, you know, we regularly hold workshops around various topics, and this is a good opportunity to start connecting the baseline science uh, with people. And then when something happens, I, I know that in the case of the geologists at Oregon State University, you know, they they are in contact with um, Dogami, the state agency that uh, deals with uh, geology and and with other uh, agencies. Um, the the risk of a tsunami, which I didn't mention in the context of the coastal subduction zone, uh, is very much on people's minds on the coast. And uh, you know, having tabletop exercises and other things like that to plan for a known threat that, whose timing is completely unknown uh, is a good way to to prepare for those things. And you know, the same was true of the folks working in infectious diseases. I mean countries like Taiwan that, that had experience uh, with, with SARS uh, knew uh, that good planning would put them in better stead for the next pandemic. And so they were in, um, they were poised to react to COVID-19 much better than say the US did. Since we only have a couple minutes left and um, let me ask this question to you from Francisco. Um, do we expect actionable science to evolve, such as we improve technologies or as we deteriorate, deteriorate the environment? Um, absolutely. Um, all science evolves, right? And climate science is no exception or maybe a great example of, of evolution of understanding. Um, 
uh, you know, I think in particular, we need to evolve our understanding of Antarctica and Greenland on the temporal scale, about a century, maybe century plus, uh, as much as we can. Um, and that, you know, the, the land ice modeling community is just coming together to, to be able to, to do this in, in ways that I, I think hold out hope for actionable information about, about um, Antarctica on that scale. You know, the paleo record that is being relied on to a large extent is hundreds of thousands to millions of years old. And we're trying to get information on an 80 year time scale if you wanna talk about 2100. It's a major, major challenge. And, you know, we're not gonna get to perfect information. We're not gonna get to a single number um, the question is, what can we do to achieve a range that makes good sense in planning, even as we're, you know, in intending to do iterative, um, iterative uh, uh, adaptation uh, over time? And I would add, uh, looking back over the process by which AU arrived at its strategic plan, there was a brainstorming stage where our consultant, um, uh, Susan, I'm blanking on her last name, um, led us through thinking about different possible futures. And one of the themes that emerged was thinking about the relationship between um, society broadly and uh, especially publicly funded science and recognizing that there is there, there are a couple of um, forces at work that uh, make actionable science more important. One is uh, general skepticism about science um, and expertise uh, being a, a sort of intractable uh, feature, especially of American society, less so in other countries. Um, and, and so having scientific engagement outside of the, you know, quote, ivory tower, which broadly includes um, federal and other scientists, um, is, is important for, for showing the value of science and of expertise. Um, and then the second is related to the first, and that is um, because the, uh, the the human connections through the internet are are so much more uh, pro, uh, important and, and prominent now, um, and, and this uh, enables a sort of a, a whole stable of citizen science projects, people getting interested in the accessibility of science and in participating directly themselves, and so providing the opportunity to do that, you know, whether it's observing. Uh, birds in your neighborhood or reporting on, you know, snow quantities in the mountains or whatever, um, people get more engaged directly in uh, in the science um, enterprise and, and they're much more interested in sort of how how is this affecting everyday life. So there's sort of a mutual support that ar arrives for the whole scientific enterprise when a portion of it is a little more attuned to how science can be used. And I'm speaking, you know, broadly about AGU science, earth and space science. Um, one question that should be quick to answer, which is from Stuart Wiss, and I hope we can address it in 30 seconds. The um, scenario neutral approach focused on what com combination of precipitation and temperature leads to system stress and failure is really appealing. Has it become a standard approach? I think there might be this might be for David. So. Um... In in a decision scaling in, in the decision scaling approach that I mentioned briefly that we're in, engaged in at the PUC, we're looking at temperature and uh, precipitation scenarios of a very wide range. I don't remember the numbers, something like one to five degrees C, and negative 15 to positive 15 uh, percent uh, precipitation change. That will frame the vulnerability and allows us to ask the questions: Under what circumstances do we does our system break? Um, it's a very important part of decision making under deep uncertainty techniques, similar to adaptation pathways, and allows for scenario development over time, coupled with observations to see what pathway we're on in real time. I think we have two questions left, and we have five minutes left. So let's try to address two of them, like two minutes each. One is from William Ernst. To what extent does the inevitable need for scientists to recommend more research be counterproductive for the needs of most decision makers who mostly don't really need further precision in available data? Well, I mean, Phil, you be ready, but um, I, I will say that, that cutting edge science is critically important. Nothing I was saying should 
suggest to anyone otherwise. Um, the question is more is when is it ready for prime time, if you want to use a dated um, uh, saying. Um, and I think we, we still have work to do to understand that well. I don't think we do. I think it's actually a chaotic environment on the cutting edge side of things. Uh, and I tried to show some examples. It doesn't mean that it's true in all cases. I just was showing some examples where I think it is the case. Um, and that includes RCP, the use of emission scenarios. Um, it's not that we would never want that work to proceed. It's more the, the, the test of actionability that, that needs to be defined well and then met um, in order for us to start writing checks on behalf of our tax and ratepayers for the adaptation uh, response that's driven by uh, you know, the, the projections that, that go some distance into the future. Yeah, I, I just amplify what David said that, you know, original science um, published papers, uh, I often use the analogy of a pile of bricks and the job of the IPCC or the U.S. National Climate Assessment or these other reports that David has referred to is to look at this pile of bricks and try to put together some kind of structure. And, you know, there may be some outliers. Uh, maybe there's a projection that you know, it was based on on you know some new method or or untested data set or whatever, and it's it, at this point it's interesting, but it's it doesn't yet belong in the structure itself. Um, so that that task of assessing the state of knowledge is crucial. I, I would uh, add you on that that it is important that funding is addressed. It's one of the critical uh, needs for actionable science. We need more funding for efforts that that take on this question and that work. Uh, it's sort of a climate service issue, but it also would be valuable if the science funding agencies, this NSF, Department of Energy, and the other big funders of science were to internalize this importance and maybe a little bit bigger increment of funding toward this toward this enterprise would be valuable. Go ahead, Johan, thank you. Thanks. And our last question uh, is from Gordon Grant. He said it's a devil's adequate question. In a number of your examples, you spoke to how different assessment groups identify a most likely or most reasonable realization. This seems to open the door to critics of bias or groupthink, uh, or at least an opaque decision-making process. How do you address this? Mm -hmm. um, so. We do the best we can with the knowledge we have. In an ideal environment, I would have a panel of climate scientists and decision makers together working this, working this question through very carefully. And it might be that most likely is not a term that survives such a process. Um, I don't think they use that term in New York City, for example, where they did have exactly that kind of panel advising them on sea level rise for a number of years. Um, in the absence of that kind of work, what we did was the best job we could to translate information into a way that made sense for engineers and planners and electeds and their staffs, um, doing the work of evaluating the vulnerability of their pump station um, to sea level rise and storm surge uh, looking ahead um, for the life cycle of that project, which for a pump station we set at 90 years. Not that the pump station survives for 90 years, but it'll probably survive in place for 90 years. So it's an imperfect situation, and I think there is subjectivity that will always be in the process, but a well-designed process, a well-funded process, a diverse process can result in the best possible outcomes uh, in parsing between what might be seen as more likely and what might be seen as unlikely, but possible. Thanks, Phil, do you have any, anything to add? Okay, great, I think that concludes our Q&A. Thank you so much. And we still have 100 people on the line. Phil, do you want to wrap up? Uh, well, I want to thank uh, David for uh, uh, joining me for this. I actually invited him to be the speaker and said, can you pick a scientist that uh, you would speak with? And uh, he dragged me into this. So it's been a great pleasure, David, once again, uh, working with you. I want to thank our audience from around the world. And uh, again, 
AGU for sponsoring this webinar and Greg for and Yuhan uh, for their work to, to uh, make this work logistically. So hope to see you all over in the recession uh, reception that uh, Julie has organized. Thank you, everybody. Thank you, Yuhan. Thank you, Phil.